where you think you could potentially die, things kind of slow down. And I remember hearing the rustling of the grass and everything else was deathly quiet. And I remember thinking I could die right now and I would die in a place that I don't even know what the name of this town is, somewhere in Ukraine. For what? Today's guest is Paula Sleer, who's twice been voted as one of the most influential women in Africa. She's been a journalist and war correspondent for over 20 years, serving on the front lines of Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and most recently Ukraine, where she almost lost her life getting caught in a gunfight between Ukrainian and Russian troops. She's in a very interesting position because she works for RT, one of Russia's main news networks. She, along with the entire network, has essentially been canceled by the West, and this is the first time she's been interviewed since the ban. Enjoy the podcast. The way of Will John. All right, uh, Paula, I'm going to read off something that I saw on your Wikipedia page, and you're going to you're going to answer you're going to answer for your past actions, okay? And you're going to tell me if this is true or not. Um, so what I what I dug up was that your first big break came when after working for nearly two years without payment, you were offered a job as a producer for the Breakfast Club morning show at the South African Broadcasting Corporation. With management saying, seeing you work so hard for us without being paid, imagine how hard you'll work if we pay you. Paula, why were you working so hard for free for two years? What was going on? What was driving you? I wanted to get into television and I don't know what it's like in your part of the world, but certainly in South Africa, where I was at the time, it was very difficult. It was very much an industry of who you know, rather than what you know. And in those days, there was only one university where you could study journalism and I hadn't gone there. And there was no guarantee that even if you studied it, you'd get a, you'd get a, a gig. So I was fortunate in the sense that I had some free part-time work, some freelance gigs. Um, I used to write, I used to waitress, and that was enough to survive on. And I, I remember like any money I made was literally, you know, my bank account would go into the minus. And then I would just keep, the, the, the goal was to keep it at only minus 9,000. In, in those days, it was 9,000 rand. Um, okay. So, you know, seeing something in the plus was not going to happen, but just not to go too far in the minus. It was something I was passionate about. And, you know, I give a lot of talks, particularly at universities. And the best piece of advice I could give anyone was the best piece of advice I got, which is if you really want something, there's nothing that can stop you and nothing beats hard work. That is so true. I mean, it's something that we, you know, I mean, as we were talking before about who the audience here is and, you know, the amount of guys that want to be footballers, as you can imagine, is huge, right? And uh, to, in my day growing up, you couldn't just get on YouTube, Instagram, you couldn't message any of the guys. Now we're going to live in this whole world where me, who's been a pro for 15 years, has a channel dedicated to teaching guys and, and you know, avoiding all the stupid stuff that I did, Right. And, uh, but there always is that element that you just try and drill into them. That is this, this persistence, that perseverance, that, that drive, that thing inside you, that if you just, if you have that, it really doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter what you do, but it really doesn't. Cause if, as long as you're going to stick around long enough, you know, if you're going to work for two years for free, then you're going to figure out how to get in. You know, if you're going to train without having a club for a long period of time, you're going to get a club. It's going to happen. You know? I'm not sure I'm so, a natural journalist, but I can tell you from the capacity of employing people now, uh, I would rather employ someone who perhaps is not as brilliant or as natural, a cameraman, a journalist, but is so passionate about wanting to do it that they're prepared to work hard. I would rather take that person than the person who comes to me and for whatever reason, let's just say, I do believe you can be born with a gift for writing. Give me a person who's born with a gift for writing, but isn't motivated. I'd rather take the person who is less intrinsically suited to the job, but really wants to work. And, and, and I've proven, it's proven itself correct over and over again. So then, uh, first of all, I would agree with that. Second, uh, I believe, this is, this is going to sound incredibly egotistical. However, I believe that I'm a person that is gifted at writing. I do not like to write. You would not hire me. However, in my essays and things in school, I would get feedback from teachers on these long form things. And they would say, you got something there. And I would say, I want to go play soccer. So I'm not going to do this right now. But uh, so 
let's get into the what you've done because even trying to figure out what stories and things to talk to you about is already uh, an issue because you've done and seen a whole lot. However, I, I know we're definitely going to touch about we're going to touch on the things that are going on right now. Obviously, in Ukraine and the food shortage. I saw your report uh, in Mozambique uh, on the things that are going on there. I find that really interesting. But if you could kind of just in a, a few words, kind of kind of sum up all the stuff that you've done and, and are doing um, so we have a better understanding of what it is that's driving you to do these stories or what you're trying to get out of this. Well, I can answer what drives me. What drives me is wanting to make the world a better place. And, and that's a whole different conversation on itself because I do believe that journalism is going through some kind of crisis. And I'm in a place in my career where I actually think that as journalists, we're doing more of a disservice than a service. I mean, you mentioned the Ukraine crisis and the fact that when, when I started off in my career 20 odd years ago, there weren't a lot of TV channels. You know, you mentioned earlier having a YouTube channel, all of that. Today you have everything. And so the whole concept of a kind of objective journalist falls by the way. A lot of my work is with Russian television. So just by the nature that I'm working for a channel like that, there is a particular perspective. And that, and that's, I mean, I'm not sure where you want to go with the, the conversations, but that's also another conversation is the idea of objectivity and the idea of what does it mean to be a journalist today? And I feel quite passionate about that. I, I feel quite discouraged by my profession. Um, I think that the idea of wanting to make the world a better place is something that I could do more easily when I started out 20 years ago. So I started out in South Africa. I started with that motivation. I did a lot of stories about people. I mean, that's what journalism is. It's about sitting around that fire and telling stories that people have done for generations. And all we're doing as our generations go on is finding more sophisticated ways of doing it. I mean, we have more platforms today and we'll probably have more 10 years from now, but the essence of what is journalism is the same. It's storytelling. So in, initially, it was a lot of storytelling about South Africa, where I was born and grew up. Um, I was fortunate to be here with the great change in 94, when we had our new elections and Mandela. So it was an exciting time to be involved in South Africa. Um, after doing that for about 10 years, I moved across to the Middle East. I wanted to be part of the stories that were happening there. And without any real intention, I found myself going to every conflict zone. And I remember saying to a friend of mine who I'd grown up with, oh, my God, this is a dream come true. I always dreamed about being a war reporter. And he turned around and said, nonsense. You never said that once growing up in South Africa. <laughs> so I kind of lied to myself. But as, as, I don't know, as life kind of evolved and showed itself, I found myself becoming a war reporter. And I've, I've done that for the past 15 years or so, where I, I've been to every major conflict, whether it's Iraq, whether it's Syria, whether it's Gaza, Israel, um, Ukraine. So I, I'm in a space right now where I feel that I want to contribute to conflicts in a reporting capacity, which is why I mentioned earlier that bit about the dilemma I'm having about whether as journalists who cover conflict, we're doing a good or as I actually think I'm tending to believe, a disservice to the conflict itself. And I just want to say there, even though you told me to kind of sum it up, I think we're in a time yeah. where it's not so much whose army wins on the ground. It's increasingly whose, uh, whose opinion wins online. And I think that's a whole new arena that we've been moving into in terms of journalism and conflict reporting. And then just in the last two, three months, um, you've now found me back in my hometown in Johannesburg, South Africa. I've been appointed as the head of the channel for RT Africa. And so I'm taking a break from conflicts in the Middle East, and I'm going to be doing conflicts in Africa, of which I can tell you that there are 11 conflicts on the go right now that just never make it into the news. You know, everyone seems to be very up to date in some capacity about the Middle East, but no one really knows about conflicts here. Um, and so. I will continue with my conflict reporting, but it's also an idea of finding Africa stories that um, perhaps are not making it into the news. But then again, because I'm associated with the Russia Today, the Russian network, it's also looking for stories from a Russian perspective. Um, and that in itself is a whole different conversation. So we could talk for a while. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, there's no chance uh, that we're going to get through everything that I want to get through. However, I did already have, because you, you said, oh, where are you going to take this? One of the things that's really interesting in browsing through your Twitter is that you carry, at least for me, and I've, I've used a VPN also, uh, and I don't know where it was. I don't, it might have been in Sweden, but I, I'm, I'm guessing by what it told me that that was in the US. It carries the tag Russian State Affiliated Media, uh, which is something that I had never seen before. Because now, you know, as we go to talk about your objectivity, I don't even know how much and how, how uh, you know, 
how much can you, how objective do you feel that you are? Uh, does this play a role? I mean, there's, uh, it's so sensationalized now in the media, and, and you're probably right with the with uh, the crisis. And I have questions on what you think about media and fake news, and how we should get our news, and what we should believe. For sure, we can get into that. But at least the very uh, beginning to understand your position. You work for RT. Uh, you can be villainized over in the West uh, as whatever they want to say that you are. But you're not from there. Uh, but you still have, you know, as you as I'm assuming, your journalistic integrity. Uh, for yourself, but you can't say certain things, right? So, I mean, firstly, let me say thank you for asking the question because RT has been closed in so many parts of the world. When the war happened in February, RT was switched off here in South Africa. Um, it was switched off in most of European countries, I think probably all of Europe and all of the States. So part of the reason why I am here in South Africa is RT looking for new audiences. I mean, you know, to be blatantly honest about that. And I also think that that reflects uh, in terms of what's happening geopolitically in our world. I think we are going to see more and more of an alignment of Europe and America on the one side, and you're going to get Russia, India, China, Pakistan, those countries on the other. So I think what we see happening in the, in the media is just a reflection of what's happening politically, and what's happening politically is manifesting itself in the media. I mentioned when I started all those years ago, there, there were so few channels um, that I think there was a time that maybe as a journalist, you could be or you could claim to be objective. Um, I don't think it's possible today. I, I'm not for one moment and I'm not going to pretend that Russia today is objective. And that's why I'm OK with it. I'm OK with people criticizing the channel. I'm OK with people, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm not I'm not sitting here and telling you that I think Putin is right. That's not my job. My job, how I see it as a journalist working for a Russian television channel, is not to hide away from the fact that it's a Russian television channel. This is a Russian television channel that purports and tells the Russian point of view. Now, is the Russian point of view objective? Of course not. It's the Russian point of view. I have no problem with that. I have a problem with journalists who work for a channel that has a particular point of view, whether it's political or whether they're beholden to their advertisers and pretend to be objective. That is where I have the problem. Now, which channels are objective, which channels are not. I mean, we can have a whole discussion on it. You know, sometimes I get feedback with people saying to me, you work for RT, it's my favorite channel, the only channel that tells objectively what's happening. That's all what I'm aiming for. I, I, I don't claim to be that. I, I do have a problem and I struggle with it. So, I mean, I don't have all the answers. And, and I think where I am in my journalism career might just be a reflection of where journalism is at. I struggle because on the one hand, I think when you close RT off, you... You, it's, it's almost like an insult to listeners that they you don't believe that they can make up their own minds. I think that RT does play a role in letting people understand what the Russian government is thinking, particularly in times of war. You know, if nothing else, like I'm going to put it in inverted commas, know what your enemy is thinking. You know, there is value in that. However, I do understand that, for example, in the Second World War, what would would Britain have wanted to be broadcasting um Hitler's propaganda machine, you know, because I have been aligned with working with Hitler rather than working with Putin. Yeah. I've had death threats. I've had hate mails. Right. I've had, you can imagine the whole thing. And I have been accused of working for um, Hitler during, or in the, in the, in the run up to the Second World War. I don't have an answer for that. I'm not sure that Europe needed right. to broadcast um, Hitler's propaganda during the war. Um, but I, I, so, so that's something I wasn't able to answer. I don't think I'm, I'm doing Hitler's job 1930 in the 1930s with what I'm doing now. Um, I do think I play a, a valuable role in terms of a different perspective. And no, my stories are not objective. But um, I can give you just one small example. In, in the parts of Ukraine that I'm allowed to go and report from, that's Eastern Ukraine, where the Ukrainians there support Russia. The CNNs and the American networks are not even going to have physical access there because the minute they enter there, those people are going to see them as representatives of the Europeans and the Americans, and they will be physically targeted. As a result, those networks can only tell the perspective of what's happening in the western part of Ukraine, which is where the Ukrainians hate Russia. Same thing with me. I can't go to the western parts of Ukraine, even if I wanted to, because I would be targeted. I would be a legitimate target. Um, so my network tends to tell um, or the, the perspective of what's happening in the eastern part. Now, let's not be naive. It's not only because we don't have physical access on the ground. It's because the, the Russia today feels that the whole western mainstream media is telling one perspective and they want to tell another perspective. So what is the truth? The truth is somewhere in between all the channels. The truth is somewhere in between what all of us are reporting. Do I have my journalist integrity? I think I do. 
because I'm answerable to myself and I'm answerable to the people I interview and the audience I tell. Are my stories factually correct? 100%. Are they objective? No, they tell one particular point of view. Is that journalism? Mm. I would argue it is. But let's not lie that there is such a thing as most journalists working objectively. We, we, we can't because of physical access on the ground, because of the networks that we belong to, et cetera, et cetera. And, and one last thing, and then I promise to keep my answer short in future. Um, I, had an experience, I had an experience in the last Ukraine war, which is um, 2014, working on the front line with pro-Russia fighters. I had on me my bulletproof vest and I had a helmet, you know, what you, the, the, the kind of standard gear you wear. And it said the word press or media. The, the pro-Russian fighters that I was with asked me to take that off, to take off any kind of identif identification that pinpointed me as a journalist, because they believed that the Ukrainian military that was firing at us or firing at them would deliberately target me because they see me as a legitimate target in increasingly uh -huh. even more legitimate because the pen is becoming mightier than the sword. And it was, it was bizarre, but they told me that I was endangering their safety by appearing with them as a journalist. So if you want to talk about how journalists are perceived, and I can talk to you from conflict reporting, gone are the days 20 years ago where you go to a war zone and you're a journalist and you're seen as taking me the side and you're kind of a, a purveyor of truth and you, you, you're outside the conflict. Increasingly, we are seen as part of the conflict. We are seen as legitimate targets. So journalism has become increasingly unsafe for that. And for a myriad of reasons, the reasons being that we work for networks that are associated with a particular point of view. There are so many networks, YouTube channels, et cetera, et cetera. And I think also because, um, you know, I have everybody contacting me on Twitter today and direct contact with me. We never had that when I started off in my profession 20, 25 years ago. I have so much to say <laughs> without packing that, but it is in, and I'll ask your opinion on this too. Isn't it crazy to think back in the day when there were just a few channels, I don't know if it was better or worse that you only are receiving information from a small group. However, we felt that they were objective. Were they really objective or were they more objective? I don't know. Uh, you know, but it, we didn't as a society understand the ability for states, presidents, whoever, to really truly use the media as a wing of propaganda um, until it's been, it's been more recent. I don't, I'm not going to say that everyone was naive and they all just thought that everything they saw on TV was the truth. However, because it's so easy, because it's so prevalent now, and because the access to it is, is, you know, is a click away and anyone can do it, we're also skeptical. The, the, the term fake news, which I, I wanted to get into here uh, later, is, you know, become a thing for that reason. Because everyone, almost everyone has been duped at least once, you know, uh, maybe said something or saw something or said something that they saw. And then they, they're like, no, 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 that's not, that's not the truth at all. And so, uh, you know, I, you're in an interesting position. Uh, so I'll, I'll keep my question more pointed, at least in the sense of, uh, Let's go to the, let's go to the fake news uh, part. Basically, with the whole Trump uh, election, and I don't know how this was covered in in, in Russia, or I do have some sense uh, of it, but but not entirely. You said that the state of journalism, obviously, you know, you guys may be adding, you may be causing some damage. Let's say journalism may be causing some damage. Uh, what is the crisis exactly? And is fake news just the world that we live in from now on? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I appreciate your comments. Um, I think fake news, unfortunately, is the world in which we live in. I, I sometimes wonder how much fake news there was before. I mean, I, I don't think it's completely a new term. I think Trump probably popularized it. And, you know, I think people find it very easy now. If you don't like an opinion, they go, oh, it's fake news, which, is, which I think is problematic in itself. Um, I think if I look back on my career, I, I feel fortunate that I had the career in the time I did because I was a correspondent on the ground. So, for example, I was based in Israel and I would stand, I'm just giving you one example. I could stand on the northern border of Israel and I could look across into Syria. Now, Israel and Syria are at war. You cannot travel from Israel to Syria. If something happened in that part of Syria and I wanted to travel there, it would take me 24 hours to get there. 
So in years gone past, the channel that I work for would, would, would wait 24 hours till I could be in Syria and I would have those stories. That doesn't happen anymore because those 24 hours, it's already old news. Everybody in, in some sense has become a journalist. They pick up their phones, they take pictures and whatever. So the correspondent, as we traditionally understood ourselves as somebody being on the ground and telling the story, I think is becoming a bit outdated. I'm not saying there's no role for that person. But I'm saying increasingly, I think the role of the journalist is going to become, number one, the verification of news. So this relates to your fake news. I think going forward, more and more journalists are going to have to, or or we'll be creating jobs where people will be verifying news rather than being involved in obtaining firsthand news on the ground, which was the job of a journalist in the past. And number two, I think there is an increasing need for some kind of media literacy. Because, and I could even do with that kind of training. I mean, I don't come from a background. I mean, I, I, I've been working as a journalist for 25 years, but I, 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 I'm struggling with fake news myself. You know, for me, it's also becoming something of like, how do I know where, where, um, to verify sources that I'm using? In the past, you meet with people. <laughs> now everything is online. And um, people often ask me, because I, I, I give presentations and I sometimes feel at the end of the presentation, people are bit, um, depressed because I've basically convinced them not to believe anything that they see or read or hear. So inevitably, there's a question like, how do we know what the truth is? And, and my standard answer is that the truth is somewhere in between all of us. To use your, you know, for a person to, to for us as journalists and whoever, to actually um, give an audience the respect that they have the intelligence to access a few channels and then think for themselves and find out the truth. Having said that, that's in an ideal world. I mean, not everybody has access to different channels. Not everybody has time to access different channels. You know, you kind of, I can see it myself. I find the one or two channels that I think are are fair and give me reliable news and I access them. You just don't have enough time in the day to go through all these channels. Um, So those are some of the problems. But I do want to mention again, the media literacy. I think, I mean, this is something that is happening. And I think this is something that we need to put more attention on is to the consumer, to the viewer, to the listener. How do they know that what they're getting is not fake news? That's where we're going with the whole arena of fake news, is how to unpack fake news. And and let me just tell you another example that's problematic for me, is that a lot of journalists, and myself included, are becoming more and more armchair journalists. We're becoming, I don't know if it's fair to say we're becoming lazier, but you know, you'll see a story online and you'll think that's an interesting story and you'll take it further. And the next thing it's been reported in so many different channels that no one's really always Very seldom people go back and check the actual original story. Was the the basis of the story or the source correct? And that's the problem with fake news is that you are getting people now who deliberately put fake news out there. And as journalists, we'll, we, we, because we're, we're pressurized for time, we're in competition with each other, we're 24-hour channels and we need things out as quick as possible, we're pushing for headlines, very often we'll take a story and we'll take it further, but we don't spend enough time actually confirming the roots of that story. And so stories are being blown out of proportion that were fake to begin with. And, you know, that's, an you know, there are people, and it's hard for me to get my head around it, but there are people out there who are deliberately putting fake news out. And then we as journalists are just feeding ourselves into that. Yeah. And it, 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 I mean, the motivations for all of that are also all over the place, right? I mean, with the whole, uh, was it Cambridge Analytica, the whole thing that happened there, this is them putting this stuff. I mean, it's, it's endless, right? Uh, U.S. Is, is, is blaming Russia for doing this, China as well uh, for, you know. And so I, I don't know. Uh, but what I find interesting is that we had a ex-CIA operative, Andrew Bustamante, on the podcast uh, just a couple of weeks ago. I asked him more or less the same question uh, because he's a field agent. And uh, his wife, who also was a CIA agent, um, dealt a lot with uh, finding truth, gathering information, stuff like this. So I asked the question, which I had written down here that you already answered, which is how do you decipher the truth? And it was the same thing was basically you need to, you need to go to Fox, you need to go to CNN, you need to go to RT, you need to go to the India and then Japan, and you need to go get all these and you need to find where the facts cross, where they don't deviate. And you can be more or less fairly certain that these are the facts if they can, all these places that don't seem to be too interconnected uh, are telling the truth. And that's impossible for the, uh, uh, a normal person to do that ever. Like, what, how are you supposed to do that? That just seems ridiculous. And like, when now, 
it's so crazy if you think that the solution is that we're going to have to have somebody verifying our news for us. Like journalists are going to have to verify the news, right? Whereas before journalists were the ones to give the news. And it sucks to me just the sense that I, I have a ton of books sitting behind me, right? And the beauty of books is that you get to go deep into a subject. And that is the beauty when you get to see a journalist who gets to take the time to have all the time in the world to just delve into this, whether it's an investigative journalism thing or a documentary, right? And if we're heading to a place where we have so much information, and I think we're already here, we're already at a place where we have so much information that nothing really means anything to me anyway, because whatever, like you said, 24 hours is dead. How is it possible that something that happens like in, in a war zone is already, it's, it's done, it's old, if in, in 24 hours, I don't, if I miss a day of news, I'm already behind. It just seems like we're just in this weird spot now with the onslaught of information that it's either going to bust or people are going to give up or well, I, I, it just doesn't seem like this is going to go on because it's just there's more and more and more. And how is it going to get more? What's something it can't carry on, right? It, can, can I, can I ask myself a question in, in response to what you're saying? I would not want to be a journalist today. If I was starting off and I was 18 years old again, I'm not sure I would choose this profession because I don't like the way this profession is becoming. I agree with you. We all in information overload. What I see happening is people increasingly, and I'm just adding to the problem of what you've presented. I'm not really giving a solution, but you know, the term e echo chambers, we're all sitting in our little echo chambers. So what happens is um, I, I access, let's say Russia Today and one or two other networks, but I, I, I like the news because they already agree with what I say, <laughs> or there's something there that I like. I think that how that contributes to conversation conflict reporting is that it allows people to feel more um, determined in their view. And we get less and less exposed to other points of view. Um, and I think that's a major damage, is that with all this information, all that we're doing is kind of closing ourselves off narrower and narrower and narrower in our little information bubble, and we're not being exposed to other opinions. And I'll give you one example. I was talking at Moscow State University. I, I was um, running a I was having a lecture with some of the students that will go into um, diplomacy work. And we were talking about the Russia-Ukraine war. And they said to me, we really want to talk to American students, European students about what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. How do we do that? So I said, I, I think that's a wonderful opportunity. Talk to them. And they were like, but we can't because the minute we go onto any kind of social platform, you know what you mentioned with my Twitter account? It's either flagged or they, they refuse access to that platform. Um, because they, they they picked up as coming from Russia, they are immediately seen as, I, I guess, as Russia propaganda or whatever, but but Russia, you don't have access to those networks and to those platforms. Um, so if you had to say to me, well, Russia Today, for example, has been kicked off YouTube. We're flagged on Twitter. There's a whole lot of social media that we, we cannot access. What 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 are, what, are, what What is Russia Today going to do? They're going to look for new platforms. Russian software developers are going to make new platforms. And so we're not only going to have um, different networks, we're going to have different platforms that we're all accessing. And if Russian students are saying to me, we'd love to talk to Americans, they f they're going to only go further and further away than they are now because the platforms that allow them to interact are going to be platforms where um, presumably um, either they're not going to allow Americans to interact, presumably they're going to be Russia. Do you know what I mean? It's just becoming more and more controlled. Who yeah. Where, where the information is positioned. And that depresses me because I think we, and, and if I go back to my kind of, you know, area of conflict, even like on a, a neighbor to neighbor basis, um, forget major conflicts, but where are we having conversations? You know, you are, you are one of the few people who is coming to me with an American audience and saying to me, I want to talk to you. RT was, was, was taken off air and I've become persona non grata. I will never get a job. Not that I'm looking, but I'll never get a job with an American network. I'll never get a job with any European network um, because they will not see me as a journalist. They will uh, have been called a Russian propagandist. I have been called a, a Putin puppet. Um, and people don't appreciate that even I have an internal dilemma. I'm not for one moment, like I said to you earlier, I'm not saying everything that Russia does is correct. I'm just saying that I can see the value of having a different point of view in the understanding that let's not pretend that this is objective truth. Let's be honest that this is providing a Russian point of view. But if people are not open to that conversation, and I'm not blaming the American side or the Russian side, I'm just saying that I think we're moving to the area 
where we're going to talk less with each other and we're going to be exposed less to people who have different opinions. And you were talking about information overload. I went to a presentation the other day about the 60 second documentary. You know, documentaries are supposed to be an hour. You're supposed to spend time investigating these topics. You know, young people today have an attention span, myself included. I mean, I, I stopped reading books. I used to love reading. Now I, I spend my time online. On, I read beforehand that it's going to be a three-minute article, you know, and even that is too long sometimes. So what are we doing to ourselves? You know, are we dumbing ourselves down or are we just becoming, you know, there, there, there's a joke. If you want to have a dinner party, invite a journalist because we're very interesting. We can talk about any topic for two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what, what we're doing to everybody, you know. In the very easiest and most simplest term, it feels like we're screwed. Uh, and I mean that because I'm also, I grew up a huge reader. I am still, but that's a battle. You have to actually actively fight against the computer and the phone and whatever else you're doing in order to read. It was not like that before. I mean, you could just, you pick up the book, you could care less what happens on the thing because there's not a million things that you feel like you're missing. And so now, you know, I have to, I have to designate this. I mean, you have to fight an internal war and then also you got to fight the dings and the stuff that's going on. It's just so. Yeah. And you said, are we dumbing ourselves down? We 100% are dumbing ourselves down. There's no way. I mean, if you can't, if, if your attention span is less, then how are you going to analyze information? How are you going to take in information that's good? How are you going to decipher all this? I mean, we're definitely looking at over generations. I mean, this is definitely going to look like a, we'll be different. People are still able to do things. We're not all dumb and it doesn't all happen at once. But for how smart we could be, uh, there's just no way to say this. Like, we're dumb. Things are getting shorter and shorter. Is it going to be a 60 second documentary? Is it going to be 30 second? I mean, I, I know this too. I mean, you, you probably, I don't know if this affects how you edit or put out your news, but as a guy who has, we have, we're, we're popular on Snapchat, YouTube, um, TikTok, you know, and Instagram. We're, we're popular on all those, but like, I have to actually be careful of the way that I, edit and put out a video on TikTok, right? Knowing that the last few things that they saw were boom, bing, bang, you know, like this. And then on YouTube, I'm allowed just a little bit more time just to, you know, to get in my, my point, you know? So I, I'm cautiously optimistic about where we're, where we're headed. But I wanted to swing to a completely different topic than right now because one that's really interesting to me Becoming the head of RT in Africa is a very interesting thing. Uh, Africa is huge. I don't know. I always, people don't ever understand that, right? When they run into like Africa, they're like, oh, it's in Africa. Like, oh, you're just going to run down South Africa and pop over to Nigeria and head over to Morocco. It's like, you have no idea what you're talking about. But uh, so you're in Mozambique. That's over there on the east side. Uh, my dad is from Nigeria. Did you, have you done anything in Nigeria? What's the current state as you can see it in Nigeria, if you've spent any time there? Have you spent any time there? I haven't. I haven't done None. Nigeria. I moved, I moved over here. Sorry. I moved over here about six weeks ago. We've done Mozambique, Central African Republic, which was very interesting. Okay. One of the poorest countries in the world. Um, obviously, South Africa and the Kenya elections. And then later this I month, well, next month, I'm off to the Democratic Republic of Congo. You'll have to have you back in about two months because Nigeria is coming <laughs> back in. Okay. Okay. Then, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I saw I saw what was going on in Kenya, but I want to talk about the Mozambique thing because that actually, that also ties into what's going on in Europe. This food shortage, and I mean, we've seen headlines calling for what is going to be like the worst winter ever, and no one's going to have food, or it's happening now, or uh, whatever. You know, uh, how is that? How is that playing out, or how do you see that playing out? I saw what you said about how it's playing out in Mozambique, where. An unintended consequence of the the war is that Mozambique is not getting the grain and grains and things that they were normally getting. But how do you see that playing out as a on the world stage? It's a massive crisis. I mean, you know, we we got figures from World Food Program in the last few days that by October they will no longer have food to provide people. Um, they, 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 the figures of people who will die of starvation by the end of this year are into the millions. Um, we're talking where though where we're talking about Somalia. 
we're talking about, um, I was just trying to remember which countries it was specifically. It's more up in the north where there's been a drought. There's going to be people in Mozambique because Mozambique has also been affected by a terrible drought as well. Um, and then, of course, the supply chains, which is the story that you're talking about. So the the local production cannot cannot make up the shortfall. Um, and then you know it all, and then it becomes a blame game. Is it the Russians or is it the Ukrainians? And let's leave that aside for a moment. But it is it is an after effect of what is happening there. Um, I'm just trying to remember the other countries. I think Mali is going to be affected, but um, the uh, uh, there, there's also an interesting debate, which I'm, I'm, I know you probably are aware of, that came up here in Africa when the um, international community, particularly your UN agencies and your private donor groups put out an appeal for Ukraine, that appeal was doubled. And now they've got a second appeal going out that's almost on track. The money that they need for countries in Africa and Bangladesh is also another country. And um, I remember now the figure from Bangladesh was 1 million people that was going to face starvation in the coming months. Um, those appeals are not hitting the amount of money. And, and the problem is that the donor base is the same. And so there's this whole, you know, the big question of like, the racism or the fact that Ukraine is closer and why are countries in the Middle East and Africa um, being allowed to reach starvation point But um, when the Ukrainian refugees are receiving so much more support. But I, I mean, a part of it is also that there's just so many people who need help today. I mean, you, you, there are just so many vulnerable, vulnerable communities. Um, it's a massive story and it's going to be a massive problem here in Africa. Um, we, okay. That's one of the things we are we are monitoring is the the, the, the fact that your most vulnerable communities are not receiving food in the next few months. So, I mean, but with that taken in, and, and one of those, that's, it's also a fascinating thing, obviously, knowing that there's so much aid and push being going, but this is, it goes back to what you were saying. The fact that now with the advent of YouTube and social media and all of these things, this is what the Western world is watching. This is what they're paying attention to. There, there isn't a, who's the most famous African social media star in the West. You don't know, you know? Uh, and so therefore, uh, it's, it's, you know, with the shortened attention spans and people having to choose what they're going to care about, they're going to care about the thing that's right next door or that's, you know, on their TV. That's it. And so, uh, you know, there may be other things at play. I'm not saying that they, some people just like, oh, I don't like Africa or I don't like the Middle East or whatever. That, those, for sure, there's, there's some stuff there. But in a very simple sense, that's also what's, what's going on. Uh, so, but you're saying that Africa is going to be more or less the most affected, which does make sense now when I think about it. I don't know what the headlines that I saw, if, if they were calling for Western nations. Uh, do you know anything about what's going on in, in Holland? I, I feel like I saw some, the farmers, the Dutch farmers are having an issue. Okay. Okay. I don't know if that was connected to this, but there was some issue with the Dutch farmers and that was also going to play a role in the the start in the starvation or the potential starvation of millions of people and stuff like this. So it's a massive crisis. Yeah, I mean, in South Africa, I don't think we're looking at starvation per se, but we are looking at disrupted food lines, disrupted grain lines. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that's one of the stories that we're keeping an eye on in Africa. Another story is also, I mean, you didn't ask me, but like there, there, I mentioned to you at the beginning, eleven conflicts in Africa, um, and. A story that I have been monitoring is the, the growth of terrorism, particularly in East Africa. Now, if you look at a country like Kenya, where the United States has always maintained a very strong presence, it's always been used as a kind of base for counterterrorism operations, particularly in East Africa. We see from Mozambique um, growing um, Islamic extremism. We see Islamic State after being, um, being kind of overthrown and forcing uh, and, and being forced to collapse in Syria and Iraq, now kind of growing strength in Africa. So that's another story that I don't know how much traction it gets internationally, is the growth of terrorism on the Africa continent. And on the one hand, you and I are saying stories are so localized. But on the other hand, something like terrorism has the potential to have international impact. So that's another downside of us living in our little eco chambers and not drawing the dots between what's happening. Terrorism on the rise here is huge. Conflicts in Africa that are unresolved and that have um, international political considerations. There's a lot of countries that are still involved in Africa, whether it's China, whether it's the States, whether it's Russia, whether it's whoever. Um, a lot of that doesn't make it into the international news as well. Yeah. And I, I, I find it interesting. I've spent a decent amount of uh, 
of time in Africa and lived in Africa and played in Africa uh, also. Um, and it's just, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if there will ever be a day if we do see an African nation, I mean, many are predicting obviously Nigeria to be that one with first nation, first world, you know, level of power, the same. I mean, if you can imagine something where an African country is on the same level as, I don't know, a state in <laughs> the U.S., California, or something like this. Uh, I don't know if we'll see it. I don't know if we'll see a country per se. I mean, there's 54 countries, but it's interesting that there's quite a push now in Africa. Now, you, you will be aware of BRICS, Britain, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And that was supposed to be a kind of alternative to um, the economies of um, the mainstream, the Western economies. There's now an idea that's for BRICS to be enlarged, that you could potentially have the whole of Africa forming its own monetary system or the whole of Africa offering itself as an alternative to, and, and this would be something, for example, that Russia would be interested in because Russia has been um, kicked off the international SWIFT monetary system. One of the problems we've had, particularly myself, working for RT, is paying people. <laughs> Can't get money out of Russia to pay people. So, and then when Russia said, well, we want our gas agreements with Europe to be in rubles, and Europe said, no, we want it in euros, and, um, you know, money, money is fundamental to a lot of this discussion. So you could have Africa rising as a continent and as a, I don't know how homogeneous it can be, but kind of as a more stronger block. And that could provide a challenge or offer a solution or an alternative to the question you're posing. Isn't there, and this is a complete conspiracy, I should actually ask you about conspiracy <laughs> theories, uh, but uh, was that not... <laughs> what, what's that? Say that again? I said we're probably pretty good at them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, there is that conspiracy about, and I don't know, you may or may not have been covering Africa at the time of Muammar Gaddafi's, uh, I guess that's called an execution, assassination, I believe is probably the right the right word, but there was always one of the one of the most common conspiracy theories uh, to float around the internet was the idea that he wanted to unify Africa under a currency that would obviously lift everybody up, and that the powers that be, or whether it's France or whoever, is like, no, 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 that's not going to happen. Let's let's move this guy on out. So I don't know. I mean, the idea sounds, I mean, on on the surface, this good. Right. I mean, how are these smaller countries ever going to do anything versus being being big players in this global trade? Like, what is the Central African Republic? What are they supposed to do? You know, and it's like you're going to need to get together. And if Africa could get it together and start to utilize, I mean, the fantastic amount of resources that they have there and kind of use that and have more power to do that, it would shift the balance of power. It doesn't sound like it's a very good thing for America, China or Russia, though. Uh, so I don't know how that's going to work, but... The thing is, is, is in Africa, the, fundamental to your proposal is the question about how much power these countries have in their own hands or how much of what the leadership or the president, let's, let's be specific, the president and the prime minister of many countries is very much in the hands or closely aligned with a particular country. And very often it's not 100% in their interest to um, utilize the resources of the country for the people of the country. I mean, Africa is so rich. Um, so, you know, why haven't we seen that? Why, ha why, why do we have some of the poorest countries in the world in Africa? You have to lay the blame to some level with the, the government and the leadership in that country, and which would suggest that it's not in their interest to use their natural resources to uplift their country which begs the question, why not? Which begs the question, what alliances do they have with certain countries? Because, I mean, the African leaders are extremely wealthy. They're extremely wealthy. This we all know. African <laughs> yeah. countries are not democratic, most of them. Is there one? Is there, is there, a, is there a model? Africa? I mean, I, I, I have the potential to possibly head to Rwanda. I don't know if you've been there. Which The only thing that I truly know, I mean, obviously... Uh, somebody of my age is going to remember the issue between uh, the the conflict was the Hutus, yeah, in the Tutsis exactly. And now on the flip side, also that it's supposedly the cleanest country in Africa. Those are the two tidbits uh, that somebody in the West could. Otherwise, I don't know why Rwanda would have been in the news. So, so can I just can I just give you an add on to that? You know, just um, yeah. So Rwanda is very much perceived as being 
in the pocket or very closely aligned with the Americans, okay? Um, which might be why you are reading so much positivity about Rwanda. And it's true. It is true. I mean, I, I mean, Rwanda is very, very clean and very, very organized and very, very modern. Um, having said that, recently there was, um, to, I mentioned the, 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 the growth of Islamic terrorism. And one of the ways that they're trying to do this is to form an African um, force, to allow countries in Africa to come together and have a kind of unified force to deal with it. And the countries that are involved have excluded Rwanda, specifically because Rwanda is closely aligned with America and specifically because they do not mm. want to have that kind of force um, controlled or modeled or in any way too closely aligned with the Americans. Oh, there's a lot of politics here. <laughs> I see, I see. Yeah, but that because that's that's at the at the at the root of it. That's what's causing a whole lot of the issues. Obviously, as we said, I mean, if we really truly did have 54 independent African nations that could decide on their own what they wanted to do with all the minerals and all the oil and all that stuff, and you know, if we just, you know, what we don't want to give it to you guys. <laughs> what now? Like, if that could actually happen <laughs> in some sort of diplomatic way. I mean, it would change overnight, probably. I mean, if they couldn't just float all the money out, the, the leaders wouldn't just take off and go to London or Switzerland or wherever. You need a, a population that can that has been uplifted. I'm sorry. You know, some of these countries, like I said, I mentioned, I just came back from the Central African Republic. People are so poor. I mean, I don't even know how many of them get a, a proper education. You know, your 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 proposal there assumes that you have... A, a population that is educated, a population that has been allowed to think for themselves, a population, and, and it's questionable because it's Africa. I mean, we agree, Africa does not have to be in this situation. And there could be so much more that is done to uplift these populations that aren't. I, 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 I am suggesting that it is in the interests of certain political powers and in the interests of certain governments to keep their populations uneducated and downtrodden. I mean, even if that's not even done in a truly intentional nature, I think given that if the idea in dealing with whatever, Rwanda or whoever the country is, is to simply extract the best of the best thing that we need from them and who cares what happens to them, then that is a consequence. They're, they're not necessarily intending to say, none of you guys are going to get educated and none of you guys are going to be fit truly because you're not going to be eating good food. Uh, but that's what happens. And so uh, I don't know, obviously, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm curious, though, just for uh, two things, since we're also getting somewhat close here to the end. Uh, okay, as a war reporter, which first off, just what a title there. Well, I asked you before, which you could, that's probably the one I would, I would go with. That one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I would go with War Reporter just to make sure that everyone understands that you're not going to be messed with first off. Like, so, but yeah, as a War Reporter, uh, you had to have had at least some interesting brushes. Can you think of anything that does it, does one thing come to mind? Are there a few brushes with danger or? A couple of things, you know, like um, I thought that as I'd get older and as I'd spend more time going to conflict zones, I would become braver. It's been an experience um, for me that the opposite is happening. I am more scared now than I was 20 years ago. I think it's true what they say, that like um, youth is wasted on the young. Or, or, or when you're young, you, you think you're invincible or whatever. I'm more scared now than I used to be. So I'm not sure I would choose this profession now, but I'm, I'm grateful that I did 20 years ago. Um, people ask me, how do I keep going? You know, you, and I think it's fate. I think I, I, if I did not believe that in fate, I think I would have these little brushes and I would, I would then just be paralyzed with fear to do anything else. So, you know, the one story that comes to mind is a trip in Afghanistan. We were there for six weeks. And on week four, we had spent every day meeting the translator and um, he would arrive with the vehicle um, and he would pick up myself and the cameraman at the security boom to the hotel where we were staying at nine o'clock in the morning. The one day on week four that he phoned me in the morning to say, actually, let's make it half an hour later because the interviewee has moved half an hour, was the one day that a suicide bomber blew themselves up at nine o'clock in front wow. of the security gate and 11 people were killed. So just by the grace of God or fate, or whatever you want to call it, we had not been there that day. And we had been there every day for four weeks. You know, so things like that, that make you do a double take. There, there was an incident in Ukraine where 
we had followed the the Russian fighters um, and they had said, no, there's no Ukrainian military here. We're just kind of doing what they call a mop up of the area or just checking that everything's clean. And we got caught in an ambush. And so I've done this training where they train you what to do when you're in those situations. And I can tell you with utter confidence, I don't, didn't remember a single thing. <laughs> you know, instinct kicks in. I fl- you know, I just like kind of dropped to the ground. The bullets were going over my head. And if you've ever been in that situation, and I've, other people say that it's been the same experience for them, where you think you could potentially die, things kind of slow down. And I remember hearing the rustling of the grass. And everything else was deathly quiet. And I remember thinking, I could die right now. And I would die in a place that I don't even know what the name of this town is. Somewhere in Ukraine. For what? I remember thinking, for what? Like, is this what my life kind of came to mean? You know, one little report for a TV channel that some people like, some people don't like. Um, It's not going to change anything in the world. And... And, and and this is what my life, you know, that this this is what my life wow. came to mean. And those are the moments when you kind of ask yourself why you're doing it. And I, I don't really have a hundred percent the right answer. But yes, fate fate is a big belief is a big motivator. And I think faith, you know, I'm I'm not particularly religious, but I, I do believe that all of this makes sense in some way that I can't always determine. Because otherwise, if it was so pointless, I'm not a hundred percent sure I would have the guts or the passion to get up tomorrow and go to another war zone. That's yeah. <clears throat> I mean, to, to, I've only had one experience just to, to not nearly as traumatic as yours, but definitely somewhat where time slows down and I can completely understand what you mean by, because it sounds ridiculous to think that you're getting shot at and you can hear the rustling of the grass. Who cares about the rustling of the grass? But unless you've had that experience to where time has slowed down, you don't realize how good your perception and how what how you can think in these moments. And you know, for me, it was a it was a car accident um, with my mom, and this actually affected her. It led uh, through a long series of events and a long period of time. Actually, led to her death, uh, unfortunately. However, yeah, no, I mean, it's quite a story that would take, like you said, just a whole other podcast to talk about, but. In the, uh, when it happened, we were making a left turn. It was, I was 15, maybe something like this, 14 or 15, or maybe even 13, actually. And we were just, it was after school. Uh, we were making a left turn. And what side of the street do you guys drive on? We were on the right. Mm. You're on the right, too. Okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, no, no. We were on the left. We're on the left. You're on the right. <laughs> we're on the right. Yeah. Okay. So you're on the left. Okay. But for us, so it would be the equivalent of a right turn for you. Uh, but so, yes, we're making this this turn and, uh, you know, as we were just, the light turned green. And as it turned green, um, my mom waited a second. She's obviously driving and I'm in the passenger seat. She waited a second, not thinking of anything, just, oh, okay, great. You know, let's, let's go, the light's green. And the second she put her foot on the gas, everything was in slow motion. And I'm, you know, like I said, 13 or 14. And I'm like, what is going on? I'm like, at first you're thinking, well, this is cool. I can uh, do like I can think about everything because like time is so slow. And then, you know, we kind of edged out into the intersection. And then I realized that there's a car uh, coming, you know, at us. And still at this point, I'm like, that's weird. Why is this car coming, you know, towards us? And then, of course, boom, you know, things hit. And uh, hit her on her side, clearly, uh, and spun us just woo, 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 the, the window shattered and everything, all that. And we're, we're flipped to the other side. You know, mother, uh, motherly instinct uh, kicks in. And she, the first thing that I can basically remember is that she just asked, are you okay? She's like holding, you know, reaching her hand out and like saying, are you, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I don't feel anything. Nothing. I'm perfectly fine. Uh, you know. And she, but she uh, was pretty pretty shaken up. Now, the worst thing about it is that on the outside, nothing, nothing. You couldn't you couldn't see anything. However, she was disoriented for a, a little, but she was okay. The ambulance got there really quickly, actually. Um, while we were sitting there, boom, took her to the hospital. Basically, checked her off as okay, right? You know, my dad eventually came to the hospital. Everything seemed okay. Well, it turned out she she ended up having brain damage from this 
which obviously, you know, the cognitive issues that can happen from Rainish aren't necessarily seen immediately. And so it was a slow decay, you know, into, into all this stuff. So uh, just wild, really, uh, the, the story. But in any case, that, 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 uh, that was what happened, you know, to me in my uh, slow motion, you know, uh, experience, let's say. So, yeah, long, long tangent to, to talk about all that. But at least if I, I want to finish it up as well on maybe your... Oh, you met Nelson Mandela. He's my hero. I saw that. I don't okay. have I, you know, like I don't get too blown away with people because I don't think we should feel that way about others. I mean, you know, we're all kind of the same. But Mandela was the one person for me. He did have an aura. He like kind of walked into the room. I, I mean, I, I interviewed him. I had a sit down interview with him once, but I, 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 I met him on many occasions. And every time he walked into the room and you just felt that you were in the presence of someone. I, I can't explain it. I've never felt that with anybody else. There's a lovely quote, in, um, a saying in South Africa that um, South Africans know that God loves us because he gave us Mandela. <laughs> and, and, and he was a blessing for this country. He really, really was. We could have gone to a civil war without uh, he I don't I, I'm not saying we're never going to civil war. I mean, that's another conversation is what's happening in South Africa. But he starved off a civil war that could have happened. He was I mean, he's just a hero to a lot of people. And and he is mine. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, having not known a whole lot about him and everything that I learned is, I wasn't, of, you know, when, when all that stuff was happening, I mean, obviously he's, he was much older than, than, than I am, but when he was so much and so clearly in the press and all that stuff, I, I started to try and kind of find like, who is this? Who is this guy? Like, what is going on? He's just, it seems like a random place for all of us to be so interested in and all this stuff. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, just truly fascinating, like his reserve and like, or his resolve, excuse me. And uh, just, it's a, it's a fascinating story just uh, in and of itself. But to know that you met him. I travel to countries where people don't know where South Africa is. Um, you know, I do get asked often, um, you're from where? From South Africa? Africa? And then I still get asked, how can you be from Africa if you're white? So that, that happens. Oh, but okay. it can be the, the, the furthest village. If I say Mandela, I'm from the country of Mandela, they've heard of it. They know that. Wow. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's that power right there. <laughs> necessarily associated with the with a particular country or anything but they know the name mandela the brand mandela yeah i, I i've always been fascinated by stuff like that i mean for instance like here in croatia most americans won't know where croatia is uh but due to the success that the country's had if i name more or less luka modric if i name their star player oh well, I know everything. I know everything. They can start. They can tell you other things about the country all of a sudden. But where it is, what it is, they don't. They don't know any of that. Uh, you also interviewed, and I don't know enough about South Africa for for sure. But I saw a picture of you interviewing, and then I, I will not. I'm going to ask you to say the name so I don't butcher it. Prince Mang starts with an M. Do you remember oh, his name? Mangasutu Batelezi. Are you talking about there him? There we go. Yes. So he is the king of the Zulus. Okay. What does that mean exactly? So one of the biggest tribes in South Africa is the Zulus. Um, that I know. It's an ethnic tribe. Um, there is a kind of internal division amongst the Zulus themselves as to who is the king and who is the prince. But he is very much acknowledged as, I think we could put him more as a kind of spiritual leader. He was, I mean, he wasn't for me on the same league as Mandela, but when I'm thinking about it, I say to you that people left an impression. He definitely did. And the impression he left me was of a pretty decent, nice, down-to-earth person. I mean, this is a man that is revered by millions of South Africans. And he has every reason in the world to... I mean, I mean, we walked and um, he, he invited me to stay for dinner afterwards and they had ordered dinner with a local catering company and the waitress had bought in the food and she bowed in front of him and like went down on her knees. Like that is traditional in her custom. Wow. And, you know, he accepts that as the custom and then he still invites me to sit next to him and he had an apple for dessert and he was, you know, cutting the apple and giving me one piece and taking one piece for himself. So you have kind of this revered statesman who's such a, a spiritual leader for so many people, but on the other hand is just like a, like a grandfather because he's quite old and, and, and you, know, yeah. you don't quite know if you should be hugging him or, or shaking his hand. And yeah. a lovely man who read the political situation in South Africa very accurately and um, is disappointed with things that are happening in South Africa, 
but still feels optimistic about this country. But he's been a bit sidelined and he would be somebody who would have a lot to share in terms of um, how South Africa could do better. He would be somebody that would be nice for you to interview, actually. Oh, I would love that. Oh my God. I, uh, I would love to. I would love to speak to him. I mean, that, that, that sort of stuff. This is the entire reason why I started the, the, the podcast. As you can imagine, um, as, you're, as, as the world attempts to pigeonhole you as uh, Russian propaganda, so I know that you will know this, they obviously try to pigeonhole me as a footballer, as just a person who kicks the ball. Come tell me about the soccer thing. Come tell me about this. Tell me about that. And it's just like, all right, I love it. However, so much more. And, and you know, actually, that begs to what we were saying about journalism and how people, media is what media is making us or wants to make us into, I don't know, into kind of two dimensional beings. And we're so much more than that. Yeah. Bite sized clips. You, we need to put your life into 140 characters so I can tweet about it and then I can determine, which is weird because that's just how we seem to want to, you know, view. Well, I don't know. Uh, that's a whole nother discussion whether or not we want this or it's being placed on us. So I won't even go there since our time is, is just done. But where can everybody check stuff out from you? I mean, we'll link to everything, obviously, here, uh, whether they're listening or watching. But um, so I think the links you have, I mean, we, we, we'll be starting soon a new website, a new um, Twitter handles, which will be RT Africa. Um, unfortunately, most of them will probably be flagged. <laughs> um, okay. We, but I think just uh, whatever happens, wh wherever we go with the development of this, if people are interested, you can always just Google my name, Paula Slea, and whatever, whatever we, 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 we introduce in the future will be linked to that. So thank okay. you. Okay. And thank you so much for, for the interview. And it was, it was my pleasure. It was really interesting to talk to you and take your questions. Good, good. I'm glad you had fun. You will have to come back sometime. Definitely. Uh, also, when you do uh, do the whole Nigeria thing as well, I'd love to cool. have your take on that. But uh, awesome. Thanks. And uh, yeah, we'll see you later. Cool. Cheers. Hey, thank you.